Okay, so this is part two of uh, passing your check ride in a Robinson R44. And the next question has to do with medical class and duration. For a private pilot, you need only a third class medical. And the duration of the certificate um, is if you are under 40 years of age, the duration of the certificate is 60 calendar months. Right? If you're over age 40, then it's good for 24 calendar months. And so what happens if you're 39 when it's issued? Uh, how long is it good for then? Well, it's good. <clears throat> the date uh, that the medical is issued it determines how long it's good for. In other words, if you're under 40 on the date of issue, let's say it's a week before your 40th birthday and you get a third class medical, that third class medical is good for five years because at the time that it was issued, you were less than 40 years of age. Let's say that you got it a week after your 40th birthday. Now the medical is only good for 24 months. Third class medical good for 24 months. And that's again, that's calendar months. For those of you that are pursuing a commercial, uh, you have to have a second class medical. And for those of the uh, applicants that are less than 40 years of age, the first class, I'm sorry, the second class medical functions as a second class medical for 12 calendar months and then goes for an additional four years as a uh, third class medical. If you're over the age of 40, and again, it's the time or the your age at the time the medical was issued is what determines it. If you're over age 40 at the time of the issue of your second class medical, then it's good for one year as a second class medical and one year as a third class medical. Okay, so the next question uh, is going to be uh, concerning pilot logbooks. And <clears throat> for those of you, again, that like uh, citing FARs, uh, FAR 61.51 concerns pilot logbooks. Right? So the first question likely that the examiner is going to ask you is going to be what hours are required to be logged? Right? And the answer to that question is, number one, the hours that prove you meet the requirements for a certificate rating or a flight review. And then number two, the hours that prove that you meet the recent flight experience or currency. Right? Those have to be logged. So when you go down for your check ride, the examiner is literally going to take your logbook and open it up <clears throat> and make sure that you meet all the requirements for the rating, okay? You can't just show up and go, you know, I've got all the hours, it's fine, you know, we're good. No, no, those hours have to be logged and you have to take that logbook with you for your check ride. And again, he'll go through and verify that you meet all of the requirements for the certificate or rating that you're applying for. And if you continue to read on in 6151, it's going to tell you all the required things that need to be documented uh, in your logbook, like the date, um, you know, the type of aircraft, the end number of the aircraft, how many takeoff and landings, where you left from, uh, you know, where your destination was, the total uh, duration of the flight, whether it was dual or solo, and you can read all of that in 6151. He's likely not going to ask you all of those details but he's very, very likely going to ask you what hours are required to be logged. Now you know the answer to that one. The other thing I'll mention is that if you guys are just starting out in your career, don't start with a little piddly little logbook because the larger logbook, so you're going to spend in your career fifty to $100,000, maybe more, in training. Uh, so you can either buy a $10 logbook and it's a pain in the behind forever, or you can go ahead and start with a $20 logbook, an extra $10 investment, and this thing is going to have plenty of extra columns for you to write, write in and record all the uh, additional information you like. A lot of times when the helicopter uh, pilots will uh, coordinate out the one column will be R22, one R44, one R66. You can put turbine time in one. And, you know, so you've just got a lot more options. So for an extra 10 bucks, it's um, well worth getting the larger logbook and I'm not having to try to figure out how to squirrel things around in the logbook to make it all work. So, so the next uh, question that you're likely to field is, uh, as a private pilot, which documents are you required to have on your person? Right? And there's three of them. The first one is your medical certificate. Your second, the second one is your pilot certificate. And the third thing is a government issued photo ID. So those are the three documents that you need to have on your person to operate as a private pilot, all right? Commercial pilot, <clears throat> it's exactly the same thing. You need those three documents on you 
to operate as a commercial pilot. All right, leads into the next question. What are the four documents that are required to be on the aircraft? All right, if you guys remember the good old little mnemonic that was AERO, or A-R-O-W. The A stands for Airworthiness Certificate. The R stands for Registration. The O stands for Operating Limitations. And the W stands for Weight and Balance. So let's talk about where each of those contain. The first two, that being the Airworthiness Certificate and the Registration, are within you typically a little see-through plastic document holder in the aircraft it's usually kind of down by your foot in most of the r44s so the next question is all right of those two documents that are in that document holder which one has to be on top which one do you have to be able to see through the document holder that's an easy question to answer just remember it's the first one the airworthiness certificate must go on top must be visible through the document holder Behind it comes the registration for the aircraft is kept behind the airworthiness certificate. The next two items, both the operating limitations and the weight and balance, are contained within the pilot, uh, pilot operating handbook or POH. <clears throat> that will lead to the next question is, oh, and so therefore, is the POH required to be on board the aircraft for the aircraft to be considered airworthy? And the answer is yes, the POH must be on board the aircraft for the aircraft to be considered airworthy. So I went and pulled the document holder out of the one of the R44s we have. This one's a cadet, uh, just to show you what a, a airworthiness certificate looks like. This is your airworthiness certificate. This is a registration for the aircraft. The airworthiness certificate should be on top of the registration. And then both of these items are slipped into the clear plastic uh, document holder. And again, this one's out of the cadet, and it sits down by the left foot of the flight instructor uh, when you're sitting in there. Uh, another question, and I'll go put this back in the aircraft here momentarily. Another question that they likely will answer you is, oh, by the way, the POH that you have on board the aircraft, is this specific to the aircraft, or can I, if I, if I lost this POH to the cadet, could I just uh, grab a POH out of another cadet and uh, just stick it in there? Would that be okay, or are we legal with that? And the answer is no. The POH is specific for the aircraft. <clears throat> All right, it has specific information in it uh, when you get to the weight and balance chapter, which brings me to the next question: Is uh, if you're going to see, uh, we may ask you about, uh, you know, where would you find what equipment is listed on board uh, the aircraft? And you would look in the weight and balance chapter, chapter six, and go all the way to the last page of chapter six. And, in the, and unfold it and there's your equipment list right there all right it's specific to the aircraft this one's for 334 whiskey charlie and yeah, this is the one that has to be in there and we'll be uh, looking at weight and balance in much greater detail here in the not too distant future but uh, to answer the question is uh, to answer the question rather the poh is specific to that specific aircraft so here's a bonus question for you. The uh, airworthiness certificate that I just showed you was dated uh, 16 November of 2016. And you know that a cadet has a 12 year uh, uh, timeout period and 2400 hours. So on the 12 years, is that calendar months or is that specific to the date? Uh, in other words, when Will the 12 year uh, period uh, be on that aircraft having a airworthiness certificate that was issued on 16 November 2016? And the answer is to the day, 12 years later. So 16 November uh, 2028, it will have met its 12 year uh, period. Um, so if you haven't been flying uh, any old, older uh, aircraft than uh, those built about 1975, you may not realize that the POHs in uh, all aircraft now are standardized. I believe it was 1975. They changed it so that all of the POHs would be in a standard format, and they're basically all in the same format. You know, chapter 1 is going to be general. Chapter 2 is limitations. That's where you're going to find... Your operating limitations is going to be contained within this chapter two. Right? Emergency procedures usually tagged by a red tag is three. You know, normal procedures for performance five, weight and balance six, and so they're all in the standard uh, format. So that if you jumped out of, uh, you know, a Cessna into a Piper, 
into a Beechcraft, whatever. If you look at the POH, it's all in the same order. It makes it uh, much more readily uh, easy to find uh, the information that you're looking for. So, uh, and we're going to look much more specifically at operational limitations of the R44, particularly when we get into required equipment and uh, operation of systems, we're going to be referencing the uh, operational limitations that are listed in the POH uh, much more specifically as we go. Okay, so our next issue is going to be, our next question is going to be concerning required instruments and equipment for day and night VFR. <clears throat> we're going to put off for just a second the generic list of things that the FAA requires for day and night VFR flight. And I'd like to look specifically at the things that are mandated basically by the POH specific to a Robinson R44, all right? And there's a little mnemonic, and that mnemonic is called, is a Goal H, G-O-A-L-H, Goal H. And if you look in Chapter 2, which is Operating Limitations of the R44, uh, it's actually page 2-5. And you'll see that there's a little statement here that are kind of underlying all of these little issues here. And I'll just read it to you real quick. It says alternator, RPM governor, low rotor RPM warning system, OAT gauge, and hydraulic control system must be operational for dispatch. In other words, all those systems must be functioning for you to take off with that R44, okay? So let's look at each of these items uh, separately and discuss why they're required as well, because that's what they're going to ask you, is why are these things required? Okay, so for the first one, G, G has, uh, G will be the governor, and it's pretty self-explanatory why the governor should be functional. The only time you're allowed to turn off the governor is uh, during training and uh, in an emergency, if you thought the governor was acting erratically. And that's the only time you're allowed to turn off the governor. But the governor is required to be functional for dispatch for taking off with the aircraft. Okay, O. O <clears throat> stands for the OAT gauge, outside air temperature gauge. It's like, why in the world would the outside air temperature gauge be required uh, for you to fly the aircraft? Well, there's actually about four things that you need to know uh, are, uh, that w would uh, require, or necessitate rather, the OAT gauge to be functional. Two of those are, uh, on the newer aircraft, they're right on the stick in front of you, and that being the uh, manifold pressure gauge, I'm sorry, the manifold pressure limits chart, and the VNE chart. And when you look at those two charts, you have to know what the outside air temperature is to be able to plug in your, your altitude versus temperature, which is density altitude, to figure what your maximum uh, continuous manifold pressure would be, and uh, also your VNE, right? The other thing you need to know about is what's the outside air temperature, is carburetor heat necessary or not. I was always taught that 80 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, above you can lock off the carb heat. 80 degrees and or below 80 degrees you have to use carburetor heat. And uh, so you need to know what the outside air temperature is uh, to be able to use carb heat, <clears throat> whether you know it's necessary or not. And we'll talk more about carburetor heat here in just a bit. The next thing you need to know about <clears throat> is there's some things in the uh, chart that you know a lot of people if you grow, grew up around thick air like we live down around sea level you don't really look at performance charts a whole lot in the R44 because the thing will do both an in ground effect and out of ground effect hover all the way to max gross weight uh, when you're down here in good old thick air. But there are two charts that we're going to look at much more specifically and those charts are within the chapter 5 performance and that is the OGE or out of ground effect hover chart and the IGE in ground effect hover chart. And for you to be able to use those two charts, which again, we're gonna look much more specifically here in just a bit, you need to know what the outside air temperature is to be able to plug it into the chart, okay? All right, the next item on the list <clears throat> is A or alternator, all right? All right, why does your alternator need to be uh, why is it a required item on board the aircraft, you know? Well, there are two systems that are fairly critical on board R44 that work off electricity. They are not mechanical, they're electric, all right? And those two systems are your tachometer and your governor, all right? Those two systems are electric, not mechanical. And so uh, they have to be energized uh, to be able to work correctly. And if your alternator, you know, if your alternator fails, 
and your battery was run down completely, the governor and tachometer may function actually very erratically. All right. Now, I can tell you <clears throat> from personal experience, if you lose the alternator, I've lost three of them in the R44s, and, and uh, if you lose the alternator, if your battery was good enough to start the aircraft, you likely have a good 20 to 25 minutes to be able to get to some place, to be able to land the aircraft, and not worry much about the governor or tachometer working erratically, all right? It's a good idea that they're gonna ask you, and when we talk about uh, uh, in emergency procedures, if you lose your alternator, what are you supposed to do? Well, one of the things you're supposed to do after turning the alternator switch on and off for a couple seconds is, and realizing that you've actually got an alternator failure, is to turn off all the unnecessary things. If it's during the day, turn off the lights. You can even turn the radio off if you need to. If you're going into a control field, wait till you're just outside of it, turn the radio back on, call them, come on in, try to save that battery for as much as possible. I can tell you from personal experience, lost the alternator outside of Sweetwater, Texas one time. I made it about 25 to 30 minutes into Sweetwater uh, without any difficulty at all, but you should still turn off all the unnecessary equipment and try to save that battery power for as long as you possibly can. Next item, the L is for low rotor RPM horn and light. The low rotor RPM horn and light should both be functional to dispatch for a flight. And those are pretty self-explanatory. They need to be working. The next item on the list is H, or hydraulics, all right? So your hydraulics are supposed to be functional if you for you to be able to depart on a flight with the aircraft, all right? So let's talk just a little bit about hydraulics. Okay, <clears throat> what happens if your hydraulics, and this is a question, what happens if you're in the aircraft and your hydraulics are intermittent? They're coming on, they're on for a little while, and then they go back off. And then they come on for a while, and then they go back off. What are you supposed to do? And the answer is you're supposed to turn off the hydraulics, all right? You don't want to, you know, the hydraulics are not horrible in an R44 when you lose them. Probably, I don't know, 15, 20 pounds of pressure moves the stick around. It's a little heavy, but it's not unmanageable at all. But if you lose the hydraulics, or, or I'm sorry, if you, the hydraulics are working intermittently, just turn the hydraulics off. And when you come in to land, and I think this is actually mentioned in the R66 handbook now, not in the 20 or not in the 44 handbook, but it should have been all along. And that is that you should not try to land the aircraft from a hover. All right, it's very easy just to walk it along, get it get it walking forward four or five miles an hour, three miles an hour, whatever, and just slide it on. Just do a little bit of a run-on landing if you lose the hydraulics. And the reason that you do a run-on landing is, and this sounds simplistic, and it is, but if you're going forwards, you're not going backwards, all right? You don't wanna have the hydraulics fail, you're trying to land from a hover in windy conditions and the thing slides back on you and you sit it down, you can actually hit, you can, the thing can catch and come down and actually hit hard enough to damage the tail boom if you're sliding backwards to any degree and set the thing down. So if you're going forwards, you are not going backwards. So if you lose the hydraulics, turn them off and just do a little bit of a run on landing. You don't have to run the thing on at 20 miles an hour. Just run it on four or five miles an hour, just enough that you know you're going forward and you're not gonna end up sliding backwards if you get some sort of a gust trying to land the thing from a hover, okay? So goal H, G-O-A-L-H. Those are the required things as mandated in chapter two, operating limitations in the uh, R44 handbook. Okay, <clears throat> that does it for part two. We'll continue this on part three. And if I haven't mentioned it already, please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. And uh, we'll see you guys on uh, part three.